Hey everyone, Dr. Armagani here today to talk to you about the lumbar laminectomy. This is a procedure performed through your back to help remove pressure off of your nerves. If you have severe compression of your nerves in your lower back, you may be experiencing symptoms of discomfort, particularly in your buttocks and hamstrings, but it can even go all the way down to your calves and feet. In this video, we will be discussing the normal anatomy of your lower back, as well as step-by-step -step how I perform this procedure. At the end of this video, I'll discuss risks, expected recovery, as well as any post-operative restrictions. If you want to skip around to different sections of this video, please see the timestamps in the description below to find the parts you want to learn about the most. Now that we have an overview of the video, let's get started. Okay. Now that we're here, let's start our discussion on the lumbar laminectomy. Before we get started though, we should have a better understanding of what the normal anatomy looks like in your lower back. This is a particular view as if we're looking at you from your back in. So this is going to be your lumbar vertebrae. We're going to be looking at a few of the anatomic landmarks that are important. The first of which being the spinous process. This is the bone that juts out from your vertebrae that you can actually feel when you're touching your back. Coming down from the spinous process is what's called the lamina. The lamina is the bony covering that is on top of your spinal canal. The lamina protects the spine and nerves underneath. Underneath the lamina is going to be a protective covering, which is a ligament called the ligamentum flavum. This helps protect your spinal canal. Below the ligamentum flavum and inside of your spinal canal is actually going to be the dura. The dura, you can imagine, is a long balloon that begins from the base of your skull and goes all the way down to your lower back. Inside of the dura contains spinal fluid as well as your nerve rootlets. Lastly, the connection between the bones in the lower back are going to be called the facet joints. These are the areas where your bones connect. So if you could imagine, if we call this bone your lumbar fourth vertebrae, or L4, and this bone is going to be your lumbar fifth vertebrae, or L5, the connection between these bones is going to be at this joint here on the left and on the right. These facet joints help you maintain your motion and flexibility. Let's now move on to what the view of these same structures would look like from the top. This is again a top view or a cross section where if we cut you in half, this is what we're looking at. So to orient you, up top here is going to be where the skin of your back is and way down at the bottom is going to be where the front of your body is. So going over those anatomic landmarks that we looked at previously, the spinous process is going to be in red. Remember again, the very tip of this spinous process is the bone you can actually feel when you're touching your lower back. Coming down from the spinous process is going to be the lamina. And the facet joints, which are the connections between adjacent vertebrae, are highlighted here in black. This is a joint just like any other joint that you would have in your body, like your knee or your hip. It helps connect two bones together so that you could have motion. Directly underneath the lamina is going to be that protective ligamentous covering that covers the spinal canal. That's the ligamentum flavum highlighted here in green. Beneath the ligamentum flavum is going to be that protective covering that helps protect your nerve rootlets, which are highlighted here in purple. So again, the dura is that long balloon that we're just seeing in cross-section here that protects the nerve rootlets which are inside. This white that's between the nerve rootlets and the edge of the dura is going to be spinal fluid, which basically gives nutrients to the nerves within the lower back. Lastly, the disc is highlighted here in black. When you begin to discuss what spinal stenosis is, it means a narrowing of the spinal canal. What is a spinal canal? Well, we have the spinal canal basically shown here. The borders of the spinal canal are going to be highlighted by my laser pointer here in red. And as you go around, you can see that there's ligamentum flavum, which is the pink on top. You have the disc below, and then you have bone on either side. This spinal canal is very large because you can see with the black here, which is the dura, the dura contains spinal fluid, which is white, as well as the nerve rootlets. But what happens as we age? As we age, we get some disc degeneration, we get bone spurs, and then we get ligamentum flavum thickening. And as you can see, look what happens to the size of the spinal canal. Now this doesn't happen to everyone, but it does happen to people as they get older to certain degrees. And you can see here, the size of the spinal canal 
is significantly less than what it was previously because of these three things that happen as we age. Let's take a look at this another way. These nerve rootlets have plenty of space. However, as time goes on and the spine starts to degenerate, we start seeing some changes that are represented here. Now look at the amount of space for those nerves. Much, much smaller. It's so small, in fact, that we can't even see any of that white spinal fluid anymore. That spinal fluid's completely gone. It's almost like as if someone took that long balloon that extends down from the base of your skull all the way down to your lower back and pinched it in one small area. And that's what we see here. Because of the pinch, we don't see any of that fluid anymore, and we just see these nerve rootlets all clumped up together. This is spinal stenosis. Where is the incision? Normally, we have a less than one inch incision in the middle of your back. Some people, though, as I explained earlier, can have compression in a few different areas. The size of the compression is directly related to the amount of areas that you have compressed. The lower the amount of areas that you have compressed, the smaller the incision. So here's another top view. Now let's go through step by step how I perform this procedure. You can see again, you have severe ligament thickening here, disc degeneration here, and all these nerves are clumped up within a particular area. This is the top view again. So your skin of your back is going to be up here and the front of your body is going to be highlighted down below. The goal here though is to drill through the lamina on both sides, staying away from the facet joints. We want to be able to drill through the lamina until we encounter the ligamentum flavum. Let's see that here. So here are the green cuts that we're going to make in the bone, and you can see the location of the cuts here. They go all the way down through the bone, stopping when we get to the ligamentum flavum. These bone cuts are actually outside of the facet joints, which are highlighted here. You want to stay out of these facet joints because that can cause some instability after surgery. That's not something that we want. That can lead to reoperations. Once we have an idea of where we want our bone cuts to be, we then take our high-speed drill over here on the right, and we're able to drill right through the lamina on both sides, again, all the way down to the ligamentum flavum. That is shown here. Now with these long troughs that go all the way down from the top of the lamina all the way through to the ligamentum flavum, our next step is to try to remove this bone in the middle. And the way we try to remove that bone in the middle is with this instrument called a curette. So we're able to sneak our curette right underneath and we're able to slowly lift up that bone in the middle and it slowly disappears and is taken out from the wound. Now with the lamina removed, the only thing that we have between us and decompressing the thecal sac or dura is this ligamentum flavin that I have here highlighted in red. That is the next thing that has to be removed. And to do this, we use an instrument called the pituitary. This instrument can go in kind of like alligator teeth and it slowly picks away at the ligamentum flavum as we have here and as we have on this side. Now once that's done, we can see the dura a little bit peeking out. That's highlighted here in black. So we still see a little bit of this dura, but we do know that it's still compressed over on this side and this side. So that ligamentum flavum has to be removed. That is highlighted here. Now we use this special instrument called a kerosene to remove these ligamentum flavum on either side. Once that's complete, the thecal sac will be completely decompressed. Please notice that here. So we've gone through and we've removed that ligamentum flavum, and now you can see that there's nothing touching the spine or nerves anymore at this point. At this point, the nerve rootlets are completely free, the dura is totally expanded now, and now that you see that there is expansion of the dura, you have spinal fluid surrounding the nerve rootlets, which lets us you know that this has been completely decompressed. This is the goal. Remember, all we had to do in this procedure is we removed the bone, and we removed the ligamentum flavum, and that took away all of the compression. In the process, though, we also remove any bone spurs that may also cause compression of the nerves. So here is the before look. You can see before from this top view, you have this lamina and spinous process with a very, very thickened ligamentum flavum causing severe compression of where the nerve rootlets are. You can't see any spinal fluid within here. So after surgery, though, what happens is all of that's removed. We have removed the spinous process and lamina, and now we've removed the ligamentum flavum as well. That allows the dura to fully expand, 
refill up with spinal fluid, and now nothing is touching these nerve rootlets anymore. Let's take a look at what I'm looking at from the back view as well to give you a little bit more understanding of the amount of bone that we are taking. So we have to remove bone from a couple different areas. We remove it from this area of the vertebrae, as well as down below. Remember again, up top here is going to be where your head is, and down here is going to be where your feet are. Let's call this bone L5, and let's call this bone L4. You have the facet joint connecting both vertebrae on this side and this side. And you can see the ligamentum flavum and nerve roots below. So the area that we're trying to remove is going to be highlighted here in red and green, and that's the way that we're going to do this procedure. We also want to make sure that we keep about one centimeter of space between where we make our bone cuts and the very edge of the bone here to help prevent any fractures. Now let's move everything over to the side here and bring in our high-speed drill. The high-speed drill is going to go over all the areas in red where we want the bone removed, which we're doing now. With that all removed now, we take that instrument again, the kerosene, and we try to gently remove some of the area in green. Once we remove some of this bone here and pick it out, pick it out, pick it out, now we see that there is nothing touching the nerve roots anymore. These nerve roots are now completely decompressed. And now let's bring in the top view just to give you a better understanding of what we're looking at from both views. Finally, let's take a peek at the before and after. Before, you can see that you had this spinous process here in the middle with the lamina on either side on the back view, spinous process here with the lamina out flaring on this side with the ligamentum flavum down below, which we also needed to remove. But after the procedure, we made those proper bone cuts and removed that ligamentum flavum, and now there is no more pressure on the thecal sac, there's no more pressure on these nerve rootlets, and it's completely filled up with spinal fluid. This is what that final bone removal looks like as well. And that concludes how I perform a lumbar laminectomy procedure step by step. Now that I've described step by step how I perform this procedure, what are the risks? Infection is a risk that we worry about with any sort of procedure where we have to make an incision. Because the incision is so small, the risk is very low for this, way under 1%. Patients who have an increased risk of infection tend to be those who are obese, diabetic, or are smokers. If you have one of these conditions, we do talk to you about it beforehand to let you know about this slightly increased risk. Next is really the only thing that I worry about during the surgery, and that's getting a hole within that fluid-filled sac that holds your spine and nerves. That's your dura. If there's a hole in the dura, some of that spinal fluid can leak out. If it leaks out, it's something that we need to repair. Sometimes we're able to put a stitch in it to repair it just like we would a leaky balloon. Other times we have to patch it. If that has to happen, we may have to keep you in the hospital for a day or two to make sure that it's not continuing to leak. If a spinal fluid leak does happen during surgery and it is repaired, there's about a 10% chance that we do have to bring you back to the operating room to fix it again. This is exceedingly rare. Risk of reoperation is always something that comes up from time to time with patients. What we know about this particular procedure is that there's about a 15 to 20% chance within 10 years that you may need another surgery done in the area where surgery was originally performed. Sometimes that surgery can involve a fusion if it has to happen again, but that percentage is again only about 15 to 20% within 10 years. Nerve injury is another risk that could occur with this procedure, although exceedingly rare. If you do sustain an injured nerve during this procedure, it may give you difficulty lifting your foot up. Very rare that this occurs though. Lastly, persistent pain is also something that can occur from time to time. It's very important for you to understand expectations. Your nerves have been compressed for a very long time. As a surgeon, all we can do is remove that compression and allow your body time to heal any potential damage that's been done to the nerves. We cannot fix a permanently damaged nerve though, however. While many patients see significant benefit following this surgery, some patients may have pain afterwards to some degree. Normally patients can go home with this right after surgery, meaning same day, but some patients may need to stay for a night or two depending on their age and the amount of areas that we had to work on because of the amount of compression that they may have had within their spines. Patients do complain of back pain to some degree following surgery because of the incision as well as of the duration at which the retractors were inside of the wound. This generally subsides after about a month. 
Now, some patients do have long-standing back pain from things like arthritis of their joints that we're not going to be able to fix with surgery. This is going to be the incisional type pain that you have on top of what your normal back pain is. The goal of surgery, though, is to make your legs better. Now, this brings me to my last point. Nerves generally take about one year to reach their full recovery potential. Some patients' recovery potential may be upwards of 95% of what they had before. Others may only be in the 70s or 80s. We just don't know who those patients are going to be until the one-year mark. That's because it takes that long for nerves to fully heal themselves. Immediately after surgery, though, you may have some good days and some bad days with that nerve. You just have to let the dust settle, particularly within those first six weeks, to let your brain remake the connections with the nerves down below, which have been compressed for a very long time. Over the course of that year, though, you may have good weeks and bad weeks. Again, I try to tell patients all the time, though, give it until one year. And how you feel at one year is going to be how you feel long term. Things like numbness and tingling and sometimes weakness take a very, very long time to show whether they're going to improve or not. We know that at about the one year mark. The last question I usually go over is what can I do post-op? When you go home, you're going to have a small bandage that's going to be over your incision. Underneath that bandage is going to be some butterfly strips which help keep the incision closed and all the stitches are on the inside. So after the third day after surgery, you can remove that bandage and shower normally. Simply let soap and water run down your back and then pat it dry afterwards. Probably put a new bandage over the incision for about the first week after surgery because it may rub on your pant line. After about one week, if those butterfly strips haven't fallen off on their own, it is okay to pull them off yourself. After one week though, you may not even have to cover the incision anymore. From a restriction standpoint, we say no bending, twisting, or lifting greater than 20 pounds for six weeks. This is because that small hole within the disc where that disc herniated out and we had to pluck it out takes about six weeks to fully scar over. During this time period, we don't want you doing anything strenuous because we don't want more disc material to come out of the back. After six weeks, you can return to any activity that you were previously doing. Some people ask, do I need physical therapy after? We make that determination at the six week follow-up visit to see how you're doing. The vast majority of patients are doing so well at that time that they really don't need physical therapy. During those six weeks though, it is okay for you to walk as much as you would like. Remember, you're going to have some mild lower back pain, and some days with your leg are going to be good and other days may not be so good. Just listen to your body. The more you walk though, the more you will remake those connections that may have been lost between your brain and your leg. From a pain management standpoint, we like to stress the use of over-the-counter medication. I generally tell patients to take two extra strength Tylenol three times a day. That's 1,000 milligrams of Tylenol for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In between those meals, you can take ibuprofen 600 milligrams. What that allows you to do is take alternating Tylenol and ibuprofen six times a day, which may give you a great background effect of pain relief so that you don't have to take as much prescription pain medication or a muscle relaxer. Generally though, my patients are not taking prescription pain medication for more than a week or two. I hope this gave you a good overview of frequently asked questions. And there you have it, the lumbar laminectomy. Hopefully after this video, you have a better understanding of the normal anatomy of the lower back, as well as step-by-step -step how I perform this procedure and what to expect postoperatively. If you're curious about conditions that can be treated with this particular procedure, please see the links in the description below. To have a consultation with me regarding your spine, you can call our office phone number also found below, or you can click book an appointment above if you're on our website, www.armaganispine.com. If you'd like, you can also follow me on these other platforms here. And if you're on YouTube, please comment, hit like, and subscribe to be notified about other future educational videos such as these. Take care.